Mark Twain said, few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. (laughs) His satire makes the point, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, more is caught than taught. D.L. Moody said, a good example is far better than a good precept. There is great teaching power in example. We understand this whether it's in the context of a family or in the context of our profession, our actions or our examples, they just speak louder than words. When a person is trained for a job, we don't just hand them a document that explains the job to them. At least we shouldn't do that. We need a model. We need someone to model that job for us. We need to take them there and show them by example what that job entails. Furthermore, You set an example with your work ethic. If you're late, you're training someone or teaching others that it's okay to be late. If you take long breaks, if you leave just a couple minutes early every day, you're training those around you. You're leading by example. Example is never so powerful but in the home. You don't expect your 10-year-old to know exactly how to clean the dishes by handing him or her a bullet-pointed document No, you have to show them how to do it. Hopefully you've been doing that regularly. Furthermore, your life in general is an example. Your speech, your values, what you enjoy, what you laugh at, what you cry at. All these things collect and they become a pattern to be followed. We understand, we understand this, and Jesus understood this as well. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus was calling those who heard his voice and have read his words to learn by his example, to learn what it means to be gentle and lowly in heart. In our message this morning, we're going to look at one specific example that Jesus, that we are to follow. Now, our scripture reading, our scripture passage this morning and in the preaching this morning is going to be the same as our scripture passage for our reading. So if you haven't gotten there yet, open your Bibles to John chapter 13, please. Now we are jumping into the gospel of John as Scott's been leading us through uh, the book of Romans. So uh, just a couple introductory uh, matters. The gospel of John can be divided into two halves. We might call chapters 1 through 12 the book of signs. It is within these chapters that John tells us about the miracles, or as John likes to use the the language, the signs that Jesus performed. You remember Jesus' first miracle, or as John likes to call it, his first sign, when he turned water, when Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana, or the fourth sign maybe when he fed the multitudes. These miracles served first to convince the disciples that Jesus was the Messiah, Secondly, to convince the Jews in Jesus' day that he was the Messiah. And thirdly, to convince any and all who would read, namely us, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. Now, you might call the second section, the second major portion of John, the book of glory. Now, in chapters 13 through 17, the public ministry of Jesus is over, and the focus changes in those chapters. You have the ministry of of Jesus directly towards his his disciples. In in chapters uh, 13 through 17, you have what is called the upper room discourse or the farewell discourse. Now, for the next two weeks, we're going to study two significant actions that occur at the beginning of this discourse. The first action is the washing of the disciples' feet, which we've already read today. The second action is the announcement of Jesus' betrayal which we'll study next Sunday. These two actions are not unrelated, and each has something to do with cleansing. So I've titled this morning's message, The Cleansing of the Disciples, an illustration of status and duty, which we'll unpack here. And then next Sunday's message is The Cleansing of the Disciples, a Betrayer to Remove. John chapter 13, verse 1 
Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This opening verse is a preface or an introduction to this chapter. And it gives us an important time marker for our text. Before the feast of Passover. We're familiar with the feast of Passover. We see it in other places in scripture. It's one of the holy festivals celebrated by the Jews. The feast was done annually to commemorate the last meal, Israel's last meal while in Egypt. Exodus chapter 12 gives us the details of this last meal. Each household was to select a lamb or a young goat, called a kid, without blemish on the 10th of the month of Nisan, which would be our, on our calendar, which would be something like March or April. The animal was to be slaughtered on the evening of the 14th of the month. The Israelites were then instructed to sprinkle the blood of the animal on the doorpost and lintels of the houses in which it was to be eaten. This blood would be a sign to Yahweh that he would pass over their homes, sparing their firstborn. Exodus 12, 14 says this, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generation, as a statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. In other words, Israel was commanded to commemorate their freedom from the bondage of Egypt by eating the Passover meal every year. This this, uh, feast even... uh, was the beginning of their calendar. So the very beginning of the year, they would celebrate this Passover meal. Now, the Feast of Passover is one of three pilgrimage feasts, the others being Pentecost and Tabernacles, in which all the adult males were expected to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate. As you might imagine, the days leading up to these festivals, the city would swell with people. The stone paths and crooked corridors of the city would teem with people and animals. In the days of Jesus, there can be no doubt that what would have been on the minds of these crowds was this man, Jesus of Nazareth. We can hear the racket of the crowd as they ponder who this man of Nazareth is. But there's a shift in the 13th chapter of John. Something changes. Jesus has proven through his signs and argued with his words that he is in fact the Son of God. The world has heard his testimony and seen his divine acts. He has turned water into wine. He has healed the sick. He has made the lame walk. He has fed the multitudes. He walked on water. He gave sight to the blind. He even raised the dead. The shift in chapter 13 is dramatic. The door is shut. The crowds are left outside. The maneuvering through people has ended, and the din of the crowd has subsided. The setting has changed. Jesus has shut the world out. He's gathered only his disciples. And it's in this intimate and secret place that he's going to deliver to them some of the most high and lofty words ever spoken. And it is in this warm, intimate setting that Jesus begins with the cleansing of his disciples. What we're going to see this morning is that Jesus' cleansing, that is, his washing of the disciples' feet, is both a spiritual and a practical illustration. Jesus uses the action to teach something about their spiritual status, and he uses the action as an example to be followed. Both are here in this passage. So our sermon proposition this morning goes something like this. This morning, we're going to see Jesus cleanse the feet of his disciples to illustrate the believer's spiritual status and Christian duty. John's introduction in verse 1 of this section not only helps us place the events in their proper setting, but makes the point that Jesus is in command of the situation and everything that follows. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, he knew his hour had come. He was not taken by surprise. And the command that Jesus has over this situation is expressed throughout this chapter. Verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. Verse 18, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. Jesus is in command. But what is it that Jesus knew? Jesus knew that his hour had come. His hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Father. 
Now, this isn't the hour of glorification, but the hour in which he will actually physically depart out of this world. It is this hour that would mark the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Jesus had another place that said that his hour had not come. But here we read of this dramatic hour had finally come. Jesus, John's gospel is consistent in recording Jesus' words about being sent from God. We recall Jesus' high priestly prayer in John, John 17, in which Jesus says in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus is affirming that he was with God. Verse 11 in chapter 17, And I am no longer in this world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. He is going back to the Father, going back to the place that he was. Now verse ends, verse 1 ends what seems to be with some redundancy. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. These two kind of affirmations of the love that Christ has for his own. The main clause in this verse is the very end of the sentence. Everything in this verse is subordinate to that last clause. He loved them to the end. When did he love them? Well, as we have already said, he loved them when he knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. And in what manner did he love them? In this manner, having loved his own who were in the world. Although it seems unnecessary, John is providing some extra color to the action of the main verb. Main verb. He loved them to the end, having loved them, having loved his own who were in the world. John is underlying the fact that while Jesus walked on this earth, he loved those who were in the world, who were his in the world. The focus of Jesus' love was on his own. There is a distinction between the mass of lost humanity that's outside the door and the mass of loved humanity that's inside the room. Jesus had a group of people in the world that he loved. He didn't love all those in the world. He loved his own who were in the world. And the love he had for his own was to the end. The sense here is more than mere death, although that's probably true. He did love them to death. But he loved them to the end, to the uttermost. In full supreme measure, he loved them. He loved them to the last breath. This is a love in its highest intensity. It is possible to love in this way only as the source of all love, for God is love. Therefore, he can love to the end. This is the love that Jesus has for those who are his in the world. This is the kind of love that would compel Jesus to say, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. He recalled the hymn, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be that my God should die for me? This opening verse is only an introduction to the section for John. He wants us to have the love of Christ ringing in our ears as these events unfold. Let's go to our outline and look at our first point then in verse 2. An illustration that teaches status and duty. Verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. John informs us right at the beginning that there is a betrayer in their midst, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. And it was Satan himself who was working to motivate Judas to betray Jesus and sell his whereabouts for the price of a slave. It is this demonic starting place that tips the first domino, from Judas to the Sanhedrin, from the Sanhedrin to Pilate, from Pilate to the executioners. The text is not concerned with the culpability or accountability of Judas. The biblical text fully embraces the fate of Judas, the son of perdition, as the betrayer of Jesus. In fact, as we're going to see next week, 
Judas came as the fulfillment of prophecy. Lest we feel that Judas was given an unfair deal, we do well to remember it is nothing but the grace of God that restrains a person from becoming a Judas. If we have learned anything from our current study in the book of Romans, it's that each, of one, each one of us in our natural state is an enemy of God. Our sole aim outside of Christ is to blitzkrieg the righteousness of God and hoist the flag of our own perceived righteousness. The lot of Judas is but ours outside the mercies of God. Now, why does John go from the heights of the love that Jesus has for his that are in the world to these depths of talking about Judas, who's the betrayer? Why does he do that? Go from such high a position to such low a position? Well, John wants us to understand how far-reaching the illustration of the foot washing is by letting us know that there is an enemy at the table. It's hard to think of a more powerful demonstration of Jesus' command in Matthew 5, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What's about to happen is amazing for many reasons. One of those reasons is simply that Judas is in the room. The love that Jesus has for his own is about to bleed over onto Judas. The spiritual status that this divine action represents does not apply to Judas, as we'll see, Yet the duty of the divine act, action demands the deceiver be treated no different than the true disciples. And sitting right next to the fact that Satan had thrust it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus is this wonderful statement of divine sovereignty. Verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Satan was not orchestrating his own plans, but was orchestrating the plans of God. John says two things about the Father's sovereignty in this situation. Jesus came from God, and he had been given all things from the Father. And how does Jesus express the fact that he came from God and that he had been given all things from the Father? How does he express that? He washes feet. He even washed the feet of a man who was about to betray him. Washing the feet of your peers was not a normal practice in Jesus' day. Foot washing was a tax, task reserved for the lowliest of servants. Some Jews insisted that not even Jewish slaves would wash feet. This was a task reserved only for Gentile slaves. This is bad enough, and the idea of a superior washing an inferior's feet has Absolutely no evidence in antiquity. There's no writing anywhere about anything like this happening, anywhere. The roads of Palestine were unsurfaced and uncleaned, as you might imagine. In dry weather, they would have dusty. In wet weather, they would have been muddy. Shoes were but a simple sole with a few straps holding it onto the foot. These sandals would have provided very little protection against the dust and mud of the roads. It is for this reason that homes would have a water pot near the entry of the home in which a servant would wash the soiled feet of his guests. It appears that in divine providence, the room that had been prepared for the disciples to eat the Passover meal did not have a servant. Now, the pace of the narrative slows in verse 4. It makes it, it, makes it very vivid. You can easily picture the events as it unfolds. The disciples are sitting at a low table. There are thin mats around the table, and each disciple is reclining near the table. Most are probably leaning on their left arm, and their, their legs are stretched outward from the table. The meal's already begun. They know that in most homes there would have been a servant that would have washed their feet, yet the servant wasn't there. And here they are, eating the meal with dirty feet. I mean, this isn't a, a, a real exciting, you know, meal with a man's feet to the left of you. But ever a testimony to the fact that no one was willing to stand up and do this task. As they're eating, you can imagine Jesus adjusting himself and he rises Verse 4, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, 
and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. He takes off his outer garment and he wraps a towel around himself. He dons the attire of a slave. He takes a basin. He proceeds to wash the feet of the disciples. Then he poured water into a basin, verse 5, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. This towel that Jesus wrapped around himself would have probably been fastened at his shoulder. It would have been long. It would have been long enough for him to dry the disciples' feet. It would have been a, a basin and a large jar where, it, where the servant, Jesus in this case, would have poured the water over the feet and washed them with his own towel that was wrapped around him. It's a fascinating illustration. Let me draw out a couple things here. Verse 3 says that Jesus knew all things. Jesus knew all things. All things had been given into his hands. The knowledge of such things does not fill Jesus with pride, or, but it drove him to his knees. With the knowledge that he would soon be, be clothed with the regalia of a king, he dons the regalia of a slave. This, of course, is a testimony to the love that Jesus had for his own. And love is always like this. When a loved one falls ill, the person who loves him or her will delight to do even the most routine or degrading tasks. Surely each one of us has cared for a loved one in this way. Some of us even now are caring for those we love in the hardest of ways. Friends, persevere in your care for each other. Don't be tempted to think that you are too important or successful to care for each other, even in the most menial way. Jesus was not too distinguished to love his friends in even this lowliest way. We surely have something to learn here from Jesus. Verse 3 also says that Jesus knew that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. This might have been a temptation to leave the things of this world behind. Wasn't it enough that he would lay down his life for his friends? Not for Jesus. The knowledge that he was going back to God compelled him to rise from supper and illustrate the duty of those who believe in him. In the gospel narrative, the closer Jesus gets to, the, to his father, the closer he gets to humanity. Nearness of God does not drive him away from man. It draws him closer to God. Nearness of God does not drive him away from man. It draws him closer to man. Excuse me. Here we have something to learn from Jesus. Barclay said, It is always true that there is no one closer to men than the man who is close to God. When our devotion to Christ drives us away from each other, we have stepped off course. Nearness to God and devotion to Christ drive us back into each other's lives and out into the world with the proclamation of the gospel. It's always the case. Jesus is on his way now in this illustration, and he begins to move around the room. There's only one problem, that's Peter. <laughs> so let's look at point number two, an interruption that reveals spiritual status. Enter Simon Peter, stage left. Now there's something about Simon Peter that we enjoy. His audacity makes him just come to life. And the story is filled, his story is filled with such highs and lows. He seems just so real to us. There's moments of great victory and just he just falls in the mud. Great defeat comes as well. You recall Matthew chapter 16. Peter makes this bold and powerful affirmation of who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And just a few verses later, what does Jesus say to him? He rebukes him, right? Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You're not setting your, heart, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Our text today is no exception. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, there's no mention of anyone until Jesus comes to Simon Peter. It's very possible that the disciples were embarrassed by the foot, wa foot washing, but Peter, he had to object. The pronouns are very emphatic in this. Lord, do you wash my feet? And what's really interesting about Peter's objection is that Jesus would have been fine if, if Peter, he would have been, the illustration would have been perfect if Peter would have just kept his mouth shut. 
But he doesn't do that. Jesus would have been able to illustrate the example for us to follow. But it's precisely because of this interruption that Jesus adds an additional layer of teaching. This becomes richer because of what Peter does here. Peter's interruption reveals the spiritual status of the disciples. So Jesus answers him in verse 7. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you will understand. What Jesus has in mind here is simply that Peter and presumably the other disciples would not fully understand what Jesus was doing. There's something else here. There's a mystery. This is probably an allusion to the Holy Spirit that would come after Jesus goes to the Father. It was not until Jesus had died on the cross and the Holy Spirit was given that Peter and the other disciples would really understand the importance of and extent of this lesson that Jesus was teaching. This foot washing was a very small thing in comparison to the extent of service that Jesus would offer. They had no idea at this point. They were not able to see the full picture. Now this theme or this idea of afterwards you will understand is something that runs through the chapters that follow. Just look a little bit to the right in chapter 14, verse verse 26. Jesus says to his disciples, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to, you remem- bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is going to give them understanding later. In verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 13, it's a similar idea. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. They will have understanding afterwards. Of course, Peter strikes back in verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You shall never wash my feet. Peter is humble enough to see the incongruity, that is the out-of-placeness of Christ's actions, yet proud enough to dictate to his master. Peter's words are emphatic again. Our ESV, and I'm reading from the ESV, and our NASB translations are not strong enough here. Peter is saying something like, may it never, ever, ever be that you wash my feet. Never. I like the Holman Christian translation here. It says, you shall never wash my feet, ever. That gets at it. That's what Peter's saying. Verse 8. Jesus answers him, if I do not wash you, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. The response of Jesus moves this illustration from the physical to the spiritual. The interruption from Peter provides Jesus with just the opportunity he needs to expand this teaching moment. We have these kind of moments with our kids, right? If you want to teach your kids patience, teach them how to tie their shoes, because inevitably, they won't figure it out, and they'll be frustrated. And so the, t- the opportunity to teach someone how to tie a knot becomes an opportunity to teach them about patience and practice and perseverance. Have you ever tried to teach your kids how to, try to, to blow a bubble or whistle or skip? They can't do it at first. And so those moments become greater teaching opportunities. This is the same thing here in this passage. But be honest, do you find yourself frustrated in these moments? When teaching your son how to use the lawnmower turns into a lesson on how to be aware of his surroundings and not run over the extension cord? When teaching your daughter how to bake a cake turns into a lesson on how to listen very carefully to mom's instruction as she pours an extra cup of flour into the batter? Here Jesus has the 12 gathered. This is the last night he will be with his disciples. They are all assembled together in this secret place this quiet place. He has a litany of things to explain to them. Agenda item number one, as an example of the way I want these men to care for each other, put on the uniform of a slave and wash their feet. The plan was working great until Peter. But unlike me, Jesus is not phased. Unlike us, Jesus is not phased. Jesus welcomes the opportunity and he uses this opportunity to share this astonishing news with Peter and most of the men gathered with him. Now, when Jesus uses this word wash in verse 8, he has a double meaning in mind. Jesus means that we must, that he must actually wash his feet in order to share a meal together. 
he had to actually wash Peter's feet. But the Apostle John also uses this concept of washing or cleansing to refer to something more significant than a physical washing. 1 John 1, 9 is not insignificant. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleansing or washing is an often used metaphor in the Bible referring to spiritual cleansing. You even heard it this morning in our communion message from Psalm 51, right? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. When God saves a sinner, he washes his sins away. In our songs today, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. What Jesus says to Peter is true for everyone. Unless the Lamb of God has taken away your sins, unless he has washed us, we have no share with him. The idea of not having a share in something is often used in the context of receiving an inheritance. In the Jewish mind, this may be related to receiving an eschatological blessing or a blessing in the last days, a blessing at the end. Here it is. Here it has to do with being linked with Jesus. To have a part or share in Jesus is to be linked to him, to be identified with him, to be washed by him, to confess him as Lord, to be his subject, to call him your king. But Peter is not done yet. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Here we have another very characteristic action from Peter, who is not the kind of man who goes halfway with anything. Two things. Peter clearly does not understand the full meaning of the washing that Jesus is referring to. And Peter's interjection reveals his own self-will. His own self-will. He wants to dictate the terms of this washing. One commentator illustrated Peter's suggestion this way. It's like suggesting you might improve the efficiency of a U-turn by turning 360 degrees instead of 180. In this case, you wouldn't have enhanced but negated the usefulness of the action. It's like my son who always wants to pour chocolate milk into his bowl of cereal. It's just too much, son. You've gone too far. The Cocoa Puffs will turn into chocolate milk. Peter's suggestion that Jesus wash his head and hands misses the point entirely. Peter is not connecting the dots. But Jesus does provide a little help in verse 10. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. Jesus clarifies with some proverbial imagery from his day. It is axiomatic that a man who practices the normal and expected pattern of bathing does not need to bathe his entire body when he visits a home for a feast or for a meal. The man only needs to wash his feet, for it is his feet that have become dirty during his travels. This may be somewhat comparable to us washing our hands when we go to a friend's house. We take a shower, we come to a friend's house, we wash our hands again. Because what is the, the thing that m- becomes dirty on the way over? Or our hands. We don't need to go to a friend's house and have a full bath again. That's unnecessary. Although they did wash hands in this event too. It's just not about washing hands, it's about washing feet. <clears throat> Maybe it's comparable to taking your shoes off at someone's door. Something like that. Recognizing that your feet, as you walked over, became dirty. So your shoes, in fact, so you take your shoes off and you leave them by the door in some people's homes which is fine. <clears throat> but when we travel to our friends' houses to have dinner, we have no need to take a bath. We don't need to do that. We've just cleaned before we left. It is this proverbial imagery that Jesus turns into a teaching point regarding the spiritual cleanliness of those who are in the room. Peter had no need of a full bathing because he had been spiritually regenerated. He had been forgiven. He had received salvation. And Jesus moves from Peter to the broader group when he uses the plural in verse 10. If you have an ESV, it has a footnote there. And you all are clean. I just took a trip to Texas so I can say, y'all clean. That's what they say in Texas. But that's what he's saying here. You, you're all clean, every one of you. The disciples were clean, yet there was a washing that they still needed. Interesting. Two things are true at the same time. The one who bathes is clean. Yet on his journey, he collects some dirt on his feet, and that dirt needs to be dusted off. He is clean, yet he needs to be cleaned. 
And John does use a significant verb form here in verse 10. The one who has had a bath. This verb stresses the event, that the event happened in the past, past, but its effect continues into the present. When a sinner trusts in the Savior, he is the one who has had a bath. The moment of salvation may be in the past, but its effect continues into the present. What John 13, 10 talks about is called, theologically, it's called justification. Justification is the one-time legal act of God in which our sins are forgiven and Christ's righteousness belongs to us, enabling us to be declared righteous in God's sight. If you are a believer, you have been justified. Your sins have been forgiven and Christ's righteousness belongs to you. But the one who has bathed, the one who is justified, does still need to wash his feet. As we have already mentioned in 1 John 1, 9, to show the concept of cleansing or washing is used as a spiritual metaphor, but consider this verse from a more theological perspective. Writing to believers, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John cannot be talking about justification in these verses because justification means our sins have been forgiven. We have been cleaned. Yes, but there is a daily cleansing that is needed as you and me walk through this world. We will without a doubt get some mud on our feet. Verse John 1, 9 is not talking about justification, but sanctification, another theological term. Sanctification is the pro- progressive work that God does in our lives to make us more and more like him. And sanctification requires continual confession of sin. Sanctification does not require a bath, But it is required that our feet be cleaned. And it is a requirement. Remember Jesus said in verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. It is a requirement. This verse, verse 10, has an application for all of us. For the one who has not bathed, if you have not been washed by Jesus, friends, you are spiritually unclean. You will not be accepted by God. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Do you know what the Bible says about those who have been washed? Do you understand what the Bible says? Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11 comes to mind. Since therefore we now have been justified, that is washed by the blood, much more shall we all be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You will be saved from the wrath of God and be reconciled to God. Friends, do you realize that our biggest problem is God? Because of our own sin, you and me are not safe. God is our biggest problem. Yet God has provided a way for us to stand against the torrent of his wrath. And friends, he doesn't do that by turning off the valve. No. What God does is he points the cascade of his wrath onto his son. He doesn't dam up the wrath. He doesn't turn off the valve. He points it at his son. This is why Jesus is our champion. This is why he is our advocate, why he is our savior. What God then requires of us is belief, belief in him. Will you believe in him today? Will you acknowledge that he is your champion, that he is your advocate, that he is your savior? I hope you will. Church, for, for all of us who have been bathed, we need to have our feet washed. We need to keep our feet clean through confession, 1 John 1, 9, and by drinking daily from the brook of his word. John 15, 13, if you look a little bit to the right there, or maybe on the next page, Jesus says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. God's word, the words of Jesus, scripture has a cleansing power in our lives. Psalm 119, 9 is memorable. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. 
Church, let's keep drinking from the word. Don't grow weary. We have no need of a bath, but we do need to be cleaned. We need our feet cleaned. Jesus adds in verse 10, but not every one of you, not every one of you. There was one in the room that had not been bathed. He had his feet washed, but for him it had no lasting effect because he had in fact not been washed. This is of course Judas. Jesus clarifies in verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus brings out again the fact that Jesus knew his betrayer. It's significant that Jesus does not reveal who this betrayer is at this point. He holds no grudge and he treats the betrayer no different than any of the others. Jesus washing of Judas' feet proves that no religious rite even if, if it is performed by Jesus himself, merits salvation. It is only by believing in the atoning work of Christ that one can receive spiritual cleansing. So moving to verse 12, we have our third point. An interpretation that commands Christian duty. Verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus resumes his place and asks a question, of course, revealing that there's something behind this foot washing. Do you understand what I have done to you? Verse 13, Jesus sets up the instruction to follow his example by establishing who he is. The duty of verse 14 is founded on the fact that he is that the one calling the disciples to that duty is both teacher and Lord. To call someone a, a teacher in Jesus' day is very common, didaskalos, it would have been common to say that. But it's not com- common to call someone Lord. Not in this sense, kurios. Very uncommon. The title kurios was the title that Greeks used to translate the divine name of God, Yahweh. So when the Greeks translated the Hebrew Bible into their language, every time they came across the divine name, Yahweh, they translated it with the word, the title, Kyrios, Lord. And here in verse 13, we have Jesus himself affirming that it is right to call him Lord. It is right to call him this because he says, I am, (laughs) fitting. Jesus is both teacher and Yahweh. Again, verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus is arguing, arguing from the greater to the lesser. He is the one they rightly call their teacher and Lord, and he washed their feet. They are then obligated to wash one another's feet. The point here has less less to do with the actual washing of feet and more to do with the shame associated with the act. The point is that Jesus, their Lord and teacher, lowered himself to the place of a servant. This wasn't a charge to establish some religious rite, but was a charge to stand ready to perform even the lowliest service. Now, there have been some throughout church history that have established foot washing as a Christian ordinance along with baptism and the Lord's Supper. Some have appealed to 1 Timothy 5.10. There's a passage about a widow who is uh, allowed to participate in the benefits of the community of God's people because she practices foot washing or she washed the disciples' feet. This is uh, probably just a a metaphorical idea of service that she she rendered to those around her. We might... uh, We might, in our day, call this, you know, engaging with people, welcoming people into our home, greeting one another. This act of hospitality was evident, and it was, and it ought to be evident for us. I believe that establishing foot washing as some religious ceremony, sacrament, or convention would demean, even vanquish the act as uh, the act of its far-reaching application. It is a call that all who have a share in Christ would kneel in service. To one another. So Jesus calls the disciples to pay attention in verse 16. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. This proverb from Jesus reminds the disciples of their place. They were slaves and sent men. They should not think too highly of themselves and always remember that if their master and sender does this ignoble act, they should not think any act of service is below them. And so we have a beatitude, a blessing in verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The disciples were to be blessed not simply by knowing the things that Jesus had illustrated and spoken, but by doing them, by practicing them. Knowing the right things has no value unless we do the right things, James 4, 17. We are blessed not because of what we know, one commentator said, but because of what we do with what we know. This is a blessing promised to all who are willing to live out the example of Jesus and stoop to serve one another. Now, back up in verse 14, Jesus uses the, the language of obligation. Verse 14 If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. The language of obligation. This language is also used in 1 John 2, 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. An obligation is an act or a course of action to which a person is morally or legally bound. A duty or a commitment. Being obligated to do something implies that someone is bound by contract or bound by gratitude. By the way, I'm using the words obligation, duty, responsibility as synonyms. I think in our, there's a nuance in those words, but in our day, those words are used interchangeably. We don't oftentimes think, we don't often think of obligation in in a good way. Usually we think of things, things we're obligated to do in a negative sense. Duty is often frowned upon. And we definitely don't want any more responsibility. But before we shirk from this obligation, I want to ask three questions about this. Three questions about this obligation. What motivated Jesus to serve his disciples? What motivated him to do this? Remember verse one? It was love. Love motivated him. Jesus was motivated by love. The love that Jesus had for his disciples poured over into service. Jesus is not giving us some duty so as to weigh us down. The obligation to serve one another is rooted in the great love that he has for us. This Christian duty comes to us as a reminder of the extent of his love. When we serve one another, we display this love. It reminds us of this love. He loved them to the end, to the fullest measure. It was because of his love that he obligates us to love. What qualified the disciples to be served? Well, they were near to Jesus. They were in the room. They were gathered at dinner. They let him wash their feet. They called him teacher and Lord. But as we have discovered, these disciples were already clean. This foot washing revealed actually that they didn't need a bath. That's one of the major points. They didn't need a bath. They only need needed a foot washing. They entered into the upper room with their guilt removed. They only needed their foot washed, feet washed. I would answer the question this way. What qualified the disciples to be served was their previous belief and present expression of faith in who he was. And their present expression of faith is found both in letting the king of the universe, (laughs) Jesus, wash their feet and their testimony that he was Lord, that he was curios, and teacher. He was Yahweh. But the foot washing was not the bath. Judas had his feet washed, but he was not clean. Church, what qualifies us to be served? What qualifies us to be served? Our perfect understanding of God? The perfect rationalism that we applied in seeking him out? All those good deeds we've stacked up? Maybe it's the faithful words we have spoken. What about all the truth that has come out of our mouths? Does that qualify us to be served? Maybe it's all the places that our feet have taken us that have led to holiness. The path of peace, right, that we always find ourselves engaging in. No, 
Friends, the Bible says exactly the opposite to all of that. The more we understand the depths of our sin, the more we will marvel at the heights of Christ's sacrifice. Thomas Watson said, until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Our obligation to serve one another is rooted not only in the love of Christ, but in the gratitude we have for the one who saves sinners. Romans 4, 5, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies who? The ungodly. (laughs) He justifies the ungodly. Psalm 25, verse 8, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs who in the way? Sinners in the way. He justifies the ungodly. He instructs sinners in the way. Until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. What motivated Jesus to serve the disciples was love. What qualified the disciples to be served? The disciples simply had to sit and allow Jesus to wash their dirty feet. They had to submit to his servant leadership. What is the result of living out the obligation to serve others? What is the result? Well, verse 17 If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The result is a blessing. Jesus promises us that if we serve one another, we will be blessed. Now, the Greek word for blessing means to be happy, to be fortunate, to be blissful. In the fullest sense, the word refers to an inward contentment that is not affected by our circumstances. The blessing that comes as a result of living out our obligation to serve serve others is not a superficial feeling, but a deep supernatural experience of contentment based on the fact that we are living out the will of God. Blessedness is rooted in the objective nature of God's service toward us and our expression of that at service towards others. Friends, living out the obligation to serve one another is the only way to find true happiness. Happiness is not found in isolation. It's just not. But on our knees, serving one another, we find true happiness. Just a thought, if you find yourself unhappy, sad, even depressed, try service as a remedy. The antidote for sadness is service. As you move closer to others and further away from yourself, I guarantee it, you will find a blessing. You will find true contentment. Friends, I hope you're encouraged by Jesus' illustration of spiritual status and Christian duty. I told you we began... We began, this is the first of two messages. In the broader context, Jesus is doing something in John 13, 1 through 30. In our text today, Jesus has taught the disciples something about cleansing. He used a divinely planned interruption to teach that we need to, we have no need of a bath, but we only need to wash our feet. Believing in Jesus is a one-time act in which we are bathed, that is justified, but it is necessary to have our feet washed. That's sanctification. Jesus also taught us using a divinely planned illustration that we are obligated to wash one another's feet. And the washing of one's feet, of course, being an illustration of the lowly act of service we are obligated to do for one another. All of this is but the first cleansing that happens in John 13. Next week, we're going to see how the disciples are cleansed when the betrayer is removed. Now, you know you're familiar with an echo, right? An echo is a reflection of sound that arrives at the listener with a delay, If you've ever watched someone do something from far away, maybe chop wood from across the lake, you see the chop, but it takes time for you to hear the sound. Maybe you've gone to a basketball game and sat at the very top of the basketball uh, arena and you, you see the guys bounce the ball, but you don't hear the sound until right after. That's how an echo works. There's a delay. When we serve each other, we don't do so to receive service from God. Rather, service is an echo of the service that we have received. This is the right way to think about our Christian obligation toward one another. The echo of Jesus' example is heard when we take on a menial task or accept a lesser role, when we refuse to insist on our own rights or privileges, by meeting others' needs before meeting our own. The echo is heard when we look for a job that no one else will do and cheerfully do it. When we focus on the results that are achieved and not on who gets the credit. Jesus expressed the greatest love by dying for us. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is that action 
that is far off in the distance that sends a sound across the water. But you and me are called to be that echo. Our service toward another is the echo of the service that we have received. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this radical act, this amazing illustration, Lord, uh, this radical act of service that you have performed for your disciples, the amazing and awe-filled illustration that is the washing of men's feet. We ask, Lord, that you, you would show us what it looks like to follow in this example, that we would do... Likewise, we are obligated to do it. We would do it out of gratitude, knowing that we, we have given you nothing and you have given us everything. And that this obligation is rooted in the, the deep love, the, the love that you have for us that is never ceasing, never ending. Lord, we pray for help to love in this way, to love in the way that you have loved us so that we might believe in, believe in that, that our action would help others to believe in who you are, Lord. That the echo would, would, would go far and wide. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.